It's a great pleasure to have Tom Porteous here in Australia from Washington, D.C., although I've just found out he resides in Baltimore, uh, and yet another story of the day. Tom is the Deputy Program Director uh, at Human Rights Watch, and uh, uh, he has a background in journalism and diplomacy and UN peacekeeping, and please give him a very warm wheeler welcome. <laughs> Julian Burnside, of course, is uh, known to us all. He's one of Australia's most committed human rights advocates and he's also a barrister in his spare time, QC. Uh, and uh, he specialises in commercial litigation. Um, and he was awarded the 2014 Sydney Peace Prize, uh, among all his other honours and accolades. So please welcome Julian as well. Um, we're going to start tonight with this terrible uh, murder that is about to take place in about nine hours' time by our friends, the Indonesian government. Uh, it's uh, being on the inside of this, of course, has given me an insight into human rights abuse that I never thought I'd personally feel, particularly when you have to hear the government, our government, talk of our, our friends uh, that, are, that are doing this. But I want to ask um, both of you, the President of Indonesia, who is the only person who can stop this and is not going to, uh, but he's the one who could have. Um, he's honoured when he travels the world. He gets to stand on stages at, you know, international conferences in funny shirts and mm. walk red carpets and he's esteemed by other leaders. It's a democratic nation. I, I want to know how I'm supposed to understand this, how you can act in the way this leader is acting um, and be so honoured. I want to understand how people that are supposed to be intelligent can be so brutal. I might start with you, Tom. Well, thank you very much and good evening. Um, and uh, I'm very pleased to be here, even though it's a, obviously a, a very somber uh, occasion. Um, uh, I think uh, you know, one, one needs to start by uh, acknowledging that Indonesia is not the only country in the world that maintains the death penalty, unfortunately. Uh, in the country where I live uh, also maintains the death penalty and in some states uses it. Um, in fact, in the state of Maryland, where I live, um, it, where, where Baltimore is, uh, they had, uh, there is a, a, a moratorium on, on the death penalty, but it's still actually on the books, which is pretty remarkable if you think about uh, you know, how much progress we're supposed to have made. Um, so I think that uh, you know, uh, one, one of the reasons why uh, presidents and leaders of countries that do uh, judicially kill uh, their and other citizens um, is because you know the leader of the free world, as they like, to, as the, the U.S. likes to call itself, um, continues to do that. And, and indeed, Widodo in this case has has repetitively spoken of the U.S. The U.S. is heading in the right direction, though, uh, in terms of the number of states that are either stopping it or on a on a moratorium. Can you see a, a, an end date where where there might not be the death penalty in the U.S.? Because until the, that happens, it's not going to stop. I can't see else. it on the horizon, to be honest. I mean, Julian might have another another view of it. Um, uh, you know, at, at, at the moment, uh, they're even thinking of bringing back the firing squad in some mm. states uh, or gas because uh, mm. they can't get hold of the lethal uh, chemicals uh, that make up the cocktail that they, which in the currently favoured, uh, you know, lethal injection form of the death penalty because. Uh, many of the countries that produce the, those chemicals refu refuse, rightly, to uh, export them to the U.S. as long as they maintain the death penalty. Um, so, uh, unfortunately, there are some states where it's quite hard to see change in the near future. Mm -hmm. yeah. and it is fair to say, I think, that um, in America the conversation is more about the method rather than the use. Mm 
of, uh, right. of capital punishment. And, you know, you, apropos what you said about uh, the Indonesian president, Barack Obama is also honoured wherever he goes and presumably mm. would be able to, um, well, can pardon prisoners of all sorts and has recently pardoned, what, several hundred prisoners, uh, although none of them, I think, capital cases. They weren't on death row. They were life sentence yeah. prisoners, 200 of them. Yeah. Mm. Um, so what do you do? And by the way, since we're on capital punishment, um, can I just acknowledge the presence of Barry Jones in the audience, who was the great campaigner against capital punishment in Australia, and although he didn't manage to save Ronald Ryan against Henry Bolte, I think, Barry, your campaign ended capital punishment in Australia. Indeed it did. <laughs> And uh, I can add that Barry's also the reason that I became interested in death penalty issues. Thanks a lot, Barry. <laughs> what can we do about sticking with capital punishment? We will broaden it out shortly. But when you have uh, an obstacle as big as this, you've got nation states like the US, like Indonesia, countless others, uh, that, that practice something that Human Rights Watch, uh, you know, this is right on their list of, of, of complete abuses of, of human rights, the, 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 the dignity of living. Um, how, do you, how do you stop it? How do you change this? Well, I mean, it's a good question. And one of the, one of the problems with the death penalty is that uh, it is actually permitted in international law, um, uh, although not for all uh, offences. Um, so uh, it's quite hard to campaign on the basis of legality. Uh, one has to campaign on the basis of uh, you know, just the sheer horror of it, uh, which I think most people, or many people, recognise. Um, I think you can also point out that you know, almost all studies have shown that it's completely ineffective as a deterrent. Um, uh, it's also, I think, useful to point out that uh, the application of the death penalty does drag society down to the levels of its most irrational and violent members. Um, and that's, I think, why it's ineffective. Um, it's, it's bad for society. And it's also, I think, important to point out, and perhaps useful to point out, particularly in, in the United States, a, a democracy, uh, that it is uh, you know, an expression of excessive state power over the individual. Uh, and to that extent, it is a threat to the human rights of all individuals in the society. Um, and uh, I think that's a, that's a very powerful argument um, that, that should be made over and over again. It is, it is worth noticing, isn't it, that capital punishment, no matter where or how it is carried out, uh, involves taking a person who's been convicted, rightly or wrongly, but assume rightly convicted of some bad crime, and then when all passion is spent, when the person is entirely at the mercy of the state, they are then cold-bloodedly executed. Now, in any other context, that would be treated simply as murder. And yet when the state does it, it has a gloss of respectability in some people's minds, which I find utterly impossible to understand. The other point, obviously, is, you know, uh, to hi highlight is, is that, you know, when you combine uh, judicial fallibility, which is there, mm -hmm. wherever you are, with the irreversibility of the death penalty, you, 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 you have, you know, a, a possibility or actually a certainty over the, lo the, over the long term of killing innocent people. Mm. Mm. I was mentioning to Sally before, I don't know if there's anyone in the room who remembers the name of Dr. Crippen. Barry probably does, but Dr. Crippen, when I was growing up, Dr. Crippen was a household name, you know, the archetypal wife murderer. And recent research suggests that Dr. Crippen, who was hanged in Pentonville Prison in 1910, it turns out that the body under the cellar was probably not Cora Crippen. And that means he was wrongly convicted. Mm. Tom, you um, mentioned uh, deterrence and, you know, anybody who just sees the facts, we know that capital punishment doesn't deter crime. We, 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 it's a fact. And yet 
uh, not just uh, President Wododo, but countless other leaders use that. Julian, I, I want to ask you about this because um, you've written extensively about when leaders just make stuff up. They just say whatever they want to say. You mean in they order... lie to us? Indeed, they lie. Let's, let's, let's not gloss it up. They lie let's to us. Let's not gloss anything up. They do. They lie. Tell us about um, language in human rights abuse. Um, language is a powerful tool which can make terrible things seem acceptable. That's the, the simple answer. Um, I mean, and we see it again. I mean, well, think about, I mean, think about the power of language in relation to boat people. The most extraordinarily powerful use of language, which I think has made Australians tolerate the intolerable, uh, was when in 2001, Howard started calling boat people illegals. Mm. For 14 years, we've been hearing of them as illegals. And then, what, a year and a half ago, the Department of Immigration and Citizenship was renamed Immigration and Border Protection. And it seems rational to mistreat people in order to protect the public from criminals. The trouble is that's not what's happening. We're just mistreating people. And I was thinking, when you said what you did about um, uh, Chan and Sukumaran and how much it's affecting you, the thing about the death penalty is that it's so personal. You know, you, cannot, you can't just blur them and say they're just a bunch of people who get killed. They're individuals. And, and when you know the individuals, it, is increasingly painful. Um, the difficulty with our treatment of asylum seekers is that they've all just been turned into an undistinguished mass of dangerous criminals from whom we're being protected, and that looks all right. Mm. If, if any Australian meets an individual who's, uh, who's risked their lives at sea to get to safety and who's then been mistreated by our system, you can't help but be struck. This is just not the way you treat individual human beings. But, and that's, that's the thing. I mean, I don't know if you agree with this, Tom, but it seems to me the essential truth we have to remember is that human rights are always ultimately about how individual human beings are treated. And if you, if you, just, if you don't bring it down to individual human beings, you're probably missing the point. That's right. That's why, and, you know, the basis of our research is the voices of individual human beings, mm. the victims of human rights abuses and eyewitnesses, and mm. sometimes actually also the perpetrators. And if you can bring those voices into the public domain, that's already half the battle done. How do you do your job then as Deputy Program Director, Human Rights Watch? We're, we're talking about, I mean, you've lobbed here in Australia on a particular day where there's a particular, you know, individual abuse that's about, and everybody here knows about it. But, but normally you're out there, um, and we will talk more broadly, you know, about how do you pick what you talk about? How do you pick a country, an issue, an abuse, a time? How do you, how do, you do that? Well, I mean, our ambition for quite a long time now has been to have fairly comprehensive co coverage of, of, of the world. So we now actually cover 90 countries. Um, and then we also cover a number of thematic issues, including refugees. Um, uh, and uh, I would love actually for us to have a death penalty division. We don't. Um, that's done by the, the, the country researchers in their particular countries. We, we do campaign a lot on, on the death penalty. Um, our, our basic methodology is sort of in some ways deceptively simple, given what a complex domain it is, but um, we, uh, we investigate, so we go on the ground, um, we get as close as possible to the action. Um, we talk to the victims and, and the eyewitnesses, and the, the people who really know what happened. Um, but we also use other forms of documentary evidence, you know, f photography, video, uh, increasingly digital um, forms of, of evidence. Um, and, uh, and we use that to put together a picture of what happened. Um, and the, the second element is exposure. We get it out there in the media. Um, and uh, Human Rights Watch over the years, I think, has been quite sort of savvy about, uh, and quite sharp-elbowed sharp, sharp as well, to be honest, uh, about you know, getting itself in the media, making sure that you know, what we investigate, what we, what we uh, uncover is exposed as, as, as widely as possible in the relevant uh, media. And then we seek change through you know, advocacy with you know, the, the, the most influential uh, actors that we feel can have an influence on 
this particular issue that we're, we're dealing with. Um, so that's the basic sort of um, methodology. And if I could just give one example. Um, we did a report earlier this year on Iraq. Um, the uh, ISIS, uh, the Islamic State, had uh, been besieging a, a city in the northern Sunni areas of uh, Iraq called Amerli. Uh, for uh, several months, in fact, um, and uh, the siege was eventually lifted with the help of U.S. Uh, airstrikes by a combination of uh, Iraqi armed forces uh, it was supported by the U.S. and Shiite militias who were supported by Iran. Uh, and uh, in, the in the course of, I mean, after the, the lifting of the siege, they then went on a sort of spree, uh, burning down Sunni villages all over all around that, that particular town of Amali. Uh, we counted something like 35 villages that, where, where they'd been burnt down. And we, and we had people, we had our, our Iraq researcher with an emergencies researcher there doing that work, documenting the burning of villages, the abduction of young men, and so forth. And obviously this was a kind of revenge tactic, but it looked as if possibly it was also kind of an effort to re-engineer the demographics of the, of the, of the, of the region. Um, and then we used that, and we, we, we that report, we put together a report, used it in, in what, uh, it, it had a press conference in Washington, knocked on all the doors that we, we know in, in Washington, and we know them very well, we have a big office in Washington, D.C. We said, this is what's going on, you're supporting these people, you've got to stop it. Uh, and, uh, you know, in terms of impact, uh, you know, Iraq is really difficult, um, but, uh, during the uh, recent operation to liberate uh, Tikrit from ISIS, ISIS control, uh, we uh, have found that there have been far less uh, human rights abuses. And it seems as if the message has gone out with pressure from the US and, and uh, perhaps the UK as well, where we did advocacy, that uh, they should rein in the militias and, and stop them from doing this kind of thing. How do you divide up, though, chasing the abuses of the day with long-term, longer-term projects? Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, we've done longer-term projects, for example, uh, on migrant domestic workers. Uh, we've, we've done a whole series of reports over the years on, on abuses of migrant domestic workers, many from Indonesia, actually, but other parts of South Asia, in India, uh, Sri Lanka, Nepal, and so forth. Um, um, most of these reports have been about uh, abuses that have taken place in the Arab Gulf countries where many of these people work. Um, and uh, they're really appalling and amount in, in many cases to forced labor, with many in instances of sexual uh, um, abuse as well, um, and, uh, and torture, and all, I mean, really ho horrendous stuff. And we documented this in a whole series of uh, of, uh, of reports, and we did sort of individual advocacy with individual countries on both the sort of supply end and the, the receiving uh, end of the, of the market, if you like, for uh, migrant domestic workers. But in the end, we knew that nothing was going to happen unless we could actually get some sort of international kind of um, treaty. And so we worked with the uh, ILO, the International Labour Organization, and a couple of years ago managed to succeed, succeeded in getting a, a, a treaty within the ILO on, um, it's called Decent Work for Domestic Workers. Um, and, uh, you know, that will help us in our advocacy as we continue to work on this issue. I was interested in what you said about the um, abuses going on in Iraq um, with the Islamic State. You said you knocked on all the doors you could in Washington. What's the argument you make to them? Uh, what's the, what's the mm. nature of the argument that you make? <laughs> well, it's, it's a combination of, you know, these are serious abuses, but mm. also it's not in your interests uh, to have um, uh, you know, uh, groups that are allied to a government that you support carrying out widespread abuses because it's ineffective. Mm. So th there's the morality mm. argument, but there's also the effectiveness argument. And frankly, in the, when it comes to the effectiveness argument, we're on pretty strong ground because... Since 9-11, it's almost 15 years, for God's sake, um, you know, the abuses that have been carried out in the name of uh, counter-terrorism by the US and its mm. allies, including the, U the UK, and I was working as the UK director of Human Rights Watch for part of that period, have really <laughs> been so counterproductive, it's just unbelievable. Uh, mm. we're, and we're now in a situation where you know, is violent Islamic, Islam, Islamist uh, 
jihadism is, is much worse than it was in 2001. Um, and I put that down in, in, in great part, not, in, not entirely, but in great part to abuses that have been carried out in the name of, of, of counterterrorism. They've fueled the grievances that exist in, in, in the region. Uh, you know, in, in the case of Iraq, the, the mistakes that were made were, were absolutely enormous and actually led directly to the creation of the Islamic State. Um, oh, they, they, that's right. They lied to us about that, didn't they? <laughs> they, they definitely <laughs> did. Mm. Uh, I, 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 I just to, want to pick up on course, one thing about this. Yeah. I mean, um, it's, it's a matter of record that most of the, maybe all of the great international human rights instruments were created after the end of the Second World War. And my impression, although I wasn't around, my impression is that when the Nazi death camps were opened up, um, the world was so shocked that they thought, we really must do something to prevent this sort of thing happening again. My impression, uh, at least in Australia, is that since 9-11, the notion of human rights and regarding human rights as important seems to have gone into retreat. The tide has started going out again. And I sometimes wonder, and it's a, something I dread, I wonder if in 50 years from now, people will look back at the second half of the 20th century and say, oh yes, remember they used to talk about human rights. The golden then. period. Just like, mm. just like. We could say, you know, back in the mm. 1920s and earlier, people used to talk about eugenics. That got a very bad name um, uh, because of the Holocaust. And in the 1890s, people used to talk about spiritualism. It's not ideas that are no longer um, popular, but ideas which have been sort of brushed off the mm. intellectual agenda altogether. And I wonder if human rights could go that way. Well, I mean, that's part of our struggle, is to make sure that it doesn't, for a start. Mm. I mean, I, I slightly take issue with the... I, mean, I understand completely where you're going, where, where you're coming from, in saying that the, the, the human rights kind of language really came to the fore after the se Second World War, but I, I don't think that's quite true in, in two ways. First of all, it, actually, it wasn't until later than that that hu human rights really became an essential part of international discourse. I think under Jimmy Carter, you know, was the first American president who really sort of started to take human rights seriously as a, as a sort of framework. Um, uh, but uh, in the but other on, on, on the other hand, on the, the other hand, it took Lemkin uh, decades until just right. after the Second World War to get the idea of genocide noticed. Right, that's um, true. And, and uh, the Universal Declaration, of course, was yeah. a direct reaction to the... But, but I would go in the other direction and say, you know, well before the, the Second World War, the idea of human rights was 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 there and, and could be quite powerful. And, that and was, the, was a the question greatest, I wanted the, to go The greatest to actually, example of that yeah. is, in fact, the the, the the abolition of the slave trade. Mm. That's that was, right. Yeah. And if you if you go back to there and you look at today, have we really advanced as much as we like to think? Uh, in you know, has it really have we really progressed at all? Yes, no, we've definitely progressed. Um, the uh, the, the, the advances that have been made, for example, in, in my, not just in my lifetime, I mean, since I was, you know, in my 30s, um, in, uh, the, in Eastern Europe have been incredible in terms of uh, hu human rights. Uh, I, w I was actually a journalist in Berlin when the, um, when the Berlin Wall came down, and I, I knew what it was like in, in, the, in East, East Germany and, and the other c countries of, of Eastern Europe, and those are now much better places in terms of human rights. Um, and Latin America, I, see, I think, has also seen a great deal of progress. And outside of uh, those regions, I think, in the Balkans is a, a lot better off than it was during the um, Balkans wars. Uh, ob obviously, the wars have come to an end, and that's a huge uh, uh, blessing. Uh, but I think the human rights situation is better. And in West Africa as well, actually, where I also worked as a peacekeeper in, in Liberia in the um, early 1990s. The, at, at the height of the wars there, there was Sierra Leone, there was uh, um, Liberia, there was uh, Guinea, uh, Cote d'Ivoire, they were all uh, immersed in, in terrible conflicts. And I think, in fact, the, the, the role of international justice, bringing Charles Taylor, the president of, uh, of, of Liberia, to justice uh, in The Hague um, had a hugely beneficial and deterrent effect um, on would-be sort of political on entrepreneurs trying to pursue their uh, interests through, you know, rampant abuses. Uh, and there's no doubt that West Africa is still very fragile, very poor and all those things, but it's certainly infinitely, in an infinitely better place than it was 
uh, 15 years ago. What about Australia, Julian? Well, um, I had a conversation with a former federal politician who was a liberal when that meant liberal. Um, he cautioned me against using the words human rights. I mean, he made it very plain. He agreed with all of my views. He just thought the words human rights were not useful. And that struck me as a very worrying... This is someone from Western Australia, so... <laughs> I have to adjust for that, but... Um, I thought it was an interesting warning. Um, and my impression is that since, since September 11, um, the idea of human rights has maybe slipped back a notch, mm. in Australia at least. Well, definitely in the Middle East. Um, we're going through a serious crisis. But even in the Middle East, you know, don't forget that the hope of, of the Arab Spring is still kept alive by what's going on in Tunisia, um, a, a successful transition from uh, a dictatorship, um, a, a dictatorship very close to the West, um, not just geographically, um, but politically, um, that was overthrown by its own people, sparked this whole Arab Spring, which has now come to, to, to tears in, in many parts of the region. But in Tunisia, it's still going on, and there's a successful transition. And I derived a great deal of hope from that. And it's still very fragile. There was a terrible a terrorist attack there, which was clearly aimed at destabilizing that transition. Um, but I still remain hopeful, even for the rest of the region, because there is still that sort of effervescence, that kind of uh, you know, desire on the part of many young people, particularly young people, who've actually had it with both repression on the one hand and also sort of religious um, fundamentalism on the other hand. And you know, the two is, is that the two are really two sides of, of, of the same coin. And I think that comes together very uh, clearly in Saudi Arabia, where you have an incredibly repressive government mm -hmm. that is also the, the standard bearer of this horrible ideology of sectarianism, of uh, um, uh, you know, Islamic uh, fundamentalism. Uh, Saudi Arabia is one of the, you know... And yet a closer ally of the American... Uh, <laughs> and of the US, yes, and quite yeah. a close ally of Australia as well, mm. dare say. I, I read the Human Rights Watch uh, 2015 report card for Australia, and uh, it's, I mean, it's mixed. We, we talk about Saudi Arabia, we talk about other places and what Australia does have is a proud history in some respects. Um, in but apparently many. we're sick of being lectured to by <laughs> organisations. Well, I've got, a, I've, I've got a question. Of, this is one of the problems, isn't it, with institutions. When, <laughs> when you've got institutions like the United Nations and you can have, um, on the one hand, Tony Abbott saying, you know, you've got to listen to the Director General, what he's said about this terrible thing they're about to do in Indonesia, but then in the next breath, when it doesn't suit him, of course, it's dismissed. And uh, it's very malleable, isn't it, uh, the way institutions can be... Uh, appropriated and then and then dismissed. Have they got strength, Julian? Um, sorry, have the organisations mm. got the strength? Yeah. Well, they survive. Whether they've got the strength to overcome political dishonesty is another question. Mm. Um, I mean, you know, I, I, I suspect sometimes that in this field, Australia lives in a little bubble, isolated from world opinion. Uh, that That terrible article in the... One of the... Murdoch tabloids in London just last week or the week before by... K Katie Hopkins. Katie Hopkins, yeah. I mean, what she said about Australia I think would have shocked a lot of Australians because I don't think that's the way we see ourselves, but we don't look outside enough to notice how other people see us. It was surprisingly accurate in its portrayal <laughs> of... Uh, uh, you, better, uh, you better tell those that haven't, haven't read it, how are we seen, Tom? Um, I think... Australia's profile is n not particularly um, uh, high up uh, on the international... Not uh, great. Radar. She said we have balls of steel, tiny hearts and can-do brains. That's right. Mm. Uh, uh, in, in other words, and, and also she, there, there was another, I can't remember exactly the other phrase, but basically she was saying that you know, uh, Australia's uh, Im immigration and asylum policy was a fragrantly in breach of international law, was, uh, showed a, you know, a hardness of heart that was almost unbelievable and was extremely inventive in the way it got around mm. 
you know, international obligations. So but she was, she was right. speaking and, approvingly. She, and she was speaking and, approvingly, and, and, yes. And, and, and so we, our methods are approved of by someone who in the same article referred yeah. to refugees as vermin, viruses and cockroaches. Yeah. No, it's yeah. horrend horrendous language that, yeah. that she used. But I mean, I, you know, she's entitled to her opinion. What I find shocking is that the, you know, one of the most powerful uh, media organizations in the world should think that it's uh, right to give someone like that a platform. Mm. That, is, that, is, mm. that is really disgusting. Mm. But it is, it's an important message. Yeah. And I think it supports the idea that uh, respect for human rights is diminishing, um, especially as the pressures on various groups around the world increase so that selfishness begins to edge consideration mm. out to the side. No, there's no doubt that there are some serious challenges out there for human rights activists. Um, one of the biggest ones that we're facing at the moment in the Middle East is um, that the space for um, civil society is shrinking to almost nothing in many for two reasons. One, the, the repression of, 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 of states that still are kind of functioning, and the other is the collapse of states that are no longer functioning. Um, so. Uh, Many parts of the Middle East are actually off limits to us, um, at least officially, and many parts are off limits actually because it's just too dangerous to, to go there. So that's a problem for us. It's a problem for our, above all, for our, our partners who are, you know, local partners in those countries who are really facing an enormous amount of pressure. Another challenge is that, you know, you, you have organizations like the Islamic State that actually revel in their abuses and advertise them as part of their recruitment strategy and their, their war strategy. Um, but the Islamic State, I'm afraid, is not the only one who does, who, 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 who does that. Um, uh, I don't want to make any kind of equivalence between the Islamic State and sort of European officials, but we do sometimes come across, you know, with, in our conversations with European officials, an attitude which, especially on asylum, they say, actually, you know, and it's half in jest, um, we actually quite like it when you kind of highlight how tough we are on asylum because mm. it makes us look good to our, mm. our constituencies, you know, our, you know the, the, the publics mm. at home who think that, you know, and they obviously think that, you know, votes are to be won from um, a, a hard line uh, well, the, yeah. we have seen that, yes. Asylum and points. once again, we've seen it in the last yeah. few months in the spectacle of yeah. the uh, torture of Myron Sukumaran and Andrew Chan and their families in the way, uh, right up until today, for those of you that haven't seen the news, uh, the, 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 the bus taking the families for their very final visit today uh, stopped inexplicably 100 metres short of the port so that they were forced, they haven't done this on any other day, to walk through the media throng. And, uh, you know, uh, Myron's sister collapsed. Uh, I mean, it was just... And it, we saw it in their transfer with the absurd military. I mean, it was just obscene. Uh, and again, this was all playing to a, to a home crowd. And it's... Uh, I mean, there are, there are so many questions just in that about media and about... Um, so oh, I bet the Australian media cover it. Well, I, it was the most disgraceful media throng I've ever seen ever today. I could not believe what I saw. Mm. I'm sure there were plenty of Australian journalists that were part of it. It's so a sense of decency would have the local media refuse to carry it. Will that happen? Uh, absolutely not, no. In fact, they were reporting on the disgrace of it as they <laughs> stood there uh, yes. within it. Um, of course, a sense of decency, they would have parted and allowed these uh, in just, you know, incredibly distressed human beings to walk that hundred metres. I've really never quite seen anything like it. Julian, you have been campaigning to convince the International Criminal Court to investigate Prime Minister Tony Abbott and... Former Immigration Minister Scott Morrison... Not quite not right. Not quite right. I, I want them to investigate... Not campaigning. No, I want them to investigate Australia's treatment of boat people generally. It is not aimed at okay. any particular party or any particular individual. As crimes against humanity. Yeah, which yep. I, th I think, um, plainly enough, on, on ordinary understanding of the Statute of Rome, they are crimes against humanity. Um, but I wouldn't want it to be seen as a political gesture or okay. a party political gesture. How is that going? 
Um, look, it's going fairly well. We have a very good submission to them. And um, I'm working on getting it into the right hands. Nothing more you want to say about it nope. here to this very friendly, <laughs> no, no, no. loving audience? No, no, no. You, do, you did warn me this gets podcast. <laughs> Is this a good strategy, Tom, for a, an issue like uh, asylum seekers in the Australian context? Um, it, it might be. I mean... Look, I have to be a bit careful here because um, we no, it's a very warm. No, no, I know, but I'm just saying, <laughs> I, and I can be quite open about why. Um, the, 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 we have a, um, a delightful and incredibly effective uh, uh, director of our international justice division, a man called Richard Dicker, and he is one of the most strategic people I know. And uh, he, and, and as a result of that, he's been very effective, and in fact, it was due to his. Uh, advocacy efforts together with others that the International Criminal Court actually got going in the first place. Um, and he's been working at this for most of his career, um, and he's a remarkable individual. Um, he has a very strategic approach to what, we, what, 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 what cases we want the ICC to take, because there's a long list, mm. there's a very long list. Um, and uh, I don't know whether this would be kind of up there, but certainly... I don't think, I don't think it would be. I don't think they'd prosecute yeah, them. They've got yeah, much bigger yeah. fish to fry. But certainly to put them on notice, as a way of putting the Australian government on notice that these are crimes that might be deserving of, mm. of this kind of scrutiny, um, uh, then, you know, I think it's, it is a, a, good, a good strategy mm. sort of politically. Um, My so, objective is to have them investigated yeah, yeah. and the fact of the investigation yeah. to be yeah, noticed. Yeah. Uh, but I'm... I think mass murderers probably deserve prosecution before our politicians. When you replied about Australia's not great standing in the international community, is it this issue of asylum seekers uh, in particular, or is it a more general... Oh, no, I didn't actually... Uh, that's not actually what I said. I, I, all I said was that people don't actually sort of take much notice of Australia. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, I, I didn't realise that's what you meant. <laughs> they, 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 they like the food. I mean, um, I, whenever I go to London, I see new Australian restaurants op opening everywhere, and that's a great source of delight to the people of London because they're very good, usually. Um, but uh, the, I think people are not really aware. It's a long way. I, right. I, I discovered that, having come here for the first time just at the weekend. It's a long way to come, um, and I think people... Don't, are not very much aware of Australia. And I think Australia could actually pl play, I mean, quite apart from it, you know, its uh, failures over the asylum uh, process, it is a democracy. I mean, it's a country where you have freedom of expression, where there's a lively political debate, there's a lively civil society. Well, I don't know. <laughs> this list uh, is... Uh... <laughs> well, compared to some of the countries we work on. And, and I think yeah, that Australia is also a wealthy country. It's extremely influential yes. in, in, in Asia. And I think Australia could um, play a more uh, uh, prominent role in, in world affairs. And that could be a good thing if, if they did it in the right way. Uh, and and, and on, particularly on, you know, on the death penalty, for example, I think it would be uh, 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 Australia, you know, is quite obviously completely opposed to, to the death penalty. I think it would be good if Australia, like the UK, had a, a, a sort of initiative on the death penalty to try to limit its scope wherever you know, their diplomats operate. And, you know, and I think that they could join together with other like-minded uh, states in, in the region, perhaps, to put pressure on those states that do have the death penalty to end it. I mean, I obviously wish that too, although this, again, is the, is the problem, is that to find a country even with a policy that Australia has right of anti-death penalty, uh, the consistency on both sides of politics at times. We had John Howard who had no problem with the Bali bombers being executed. Uh, I, I mean, that was a terrible blow to, to our ability to be able to advocate both for our citizens and others. Uh, Julia Gillard... Um, had an opportunity to plead for mercy for uh, Myron and Andrew. Instead, she asked then President Udiono to give Chappelle Corby a couple of years off her sentence inexplicably when there were death sentences uh, involved. And more recently, we had Tony Abbott at the very beginning of this saga uh, uh, in Bali. Uh, the very first comment that he made was that this won't affect our relationship with Indonesia. Um, so it's, it's so hard, isn't it, to, to be a country, any country that is going to be a flag bearer for any issue. You have to have a, a really great and consistent record and 
very hard to come back from that, Julian. What, what do you think? Uh, look, I agree with the observation. I mean, I, it, I, it's, it's kind of encouraging to think that we're not noticed. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe our naughtiness will just evaporate and people won't hold it against us. Well, um, but um, I, I think we haven't distinguished ourselves. You know, considering how prosperous the country is, considering how blessed we are with natural resources, our behaviour is inexplicably bad. Mm. And, you know, at the risk of picking on a topical thing, climate change is something I think we should all be worried about, and some of us are, and the politicians are trying to talk us out of it at the moment. But um, we, we can't avoid the fact that although we're a very long way from Europe, um, we're not all that far from a lot of Pacific islands mm. that are at risk of disappearing, literally disappearing, um, if climate change caused by the engines of our prosperity um, goes the way it seemed to be going. Now, there is not a trace of a possibility that we will be generous to people who are displaced by climate change. You know, the idea of... They're called climate refugees, but they're not. They're not refugees at all, according to the convention test. I really fear for the future of those people. If they can swim from the Pacific Islands to Australia, they'll be welcomed with open arms. But if they come here by boat and they say, I can't go back to my country because it's disappeared, I think they'll be, they'll be given a very cold shoulder. And that's um, a terrible indictment of the country at large. I think we're not well served by our politicians these days, I have to say, because I hold on to the idea that the way Australia is behaving reflects practical politics at work and does not reflect Australian, the Australian character. Uh, uh, yeah, I agree with that. But how do you deal then with the argument um, that which I think is a stronger argument, frankly, in Europe than it is in, in, in Australia, that you know, there is a limit to absorption capacity um, for you know, refu refugees and, and migrants in general. How do you deal with that argument? Because we are facing a, a really critical situation, particularly in Europe, with large numbers of people who are being uprooted by war, persecution, as you say, climate, climate change could add to that. Um, and you know, and, and Europe is very close, the borders are very porous, we can't actually do anything about it, frankly, unlike in, mm. in Australia. And you have a human rights charter. Uh, right. Um, so how do you deal with that argument? Um, in Australia, in Australia, it is irrelevant. Mm. And the largest number of boat people ever to come to Australia in any 12-month period was 25,000 people. The, the average is a couple of thousand in a year, okay? So, but we get 200,000 new permanent migrants every year. The idea of 25,000 being a problem is ludicrous. Um, um, in Europe, I really can't speak of the European position because I don't know mm. the numbers. And if you're talking about demographic difficulties, then the numbers count very much. Mm. Uh, I don't think it's a demographic problem in Australia. What it is is a political opportunity which was seized on for purely political purposes by Howard in... Uh, 2001, at the time of the Tampa episode, and it's been exploited mercilessly ever since, and to their eternal discredit, Labor have never come out and said plainly, you're being deceived, these people aren't illegal. If only, if only Labor would tell the truth about it, maybe the situation would change. Or maybe we'll all find that we're, we're all assholes and it's terrible and just give it away. <laughs> If you have a question, uh, please put up your hand and if somebody puts a microphone in it, start talking. Good evening and thank you. Um, you're saying that uh, in uh, Europe and so on, people aren't really taking any notice of what we're doing here in terms of refugees, but um, I don't know the guy's name, but the head of UKIP was actually interviewed just recently in the Guardian, and he's, it's an article in the Guardian saying that he felt that he wouldn't actually go along with the same sort of uh, processes that we've introduced. He said he couldn't quite see the English people um, being dished up a policy like that and actually going with it. He said England's, England would be uh, too compassionate to do that. What yeah, do you that think was Nigel that Farage idea? just yeah. a few days ago. Yeah. No, I was, I was about to say, I mean, this is one issue where you know, people are learning a little bit from or, or looking at what Australia is doing and, and thinking, hmm, can we... Can we uh, uh, implement that here in Europe? And the answer is you can't, because the, the Mediterranean is a lot smaller than the Pacific, if you look at the map. Um, and also Europe has a very long land boundaries. There are some parts of the Mediterranean when you can literally swim across. Um, and uh, on top of that, the European Union is composed of 27 
uh, nations, none of whom really agree on what should be done, which was why this uh, reaction to this latest uh, tragedy in the Mediterranean uh, 10 days ago was, was so pathetic, because they can't actually even agree on, on sort of anything more than a sort of lowest common denominator approach. Um, so th essentially, Europe doesn't have a policy. They would like, perhaps some people w in, in Europe, like Nigel Farage, would like to have a, a sort of uh, uh, an Australian style um, policy, but it's not possible. Well, you'd have to, in order to do it, you'd have to scrap the European Human Rights Charter and the domestic legislation in each country that mirrors that charter. Um, because on any view of things, what we do here contravenes the basic norms of the European Human Rights Charter in umpteen different ways. Um, it's very interesting, actually, thinking about human rights in Australia generally. We're the only, I think, the only Western democracy not to have um, um, coherent statutory protection of human rights. Um, and we're the only country in the world that has turned its mind to having statutory protection of human rights in the 21st century and have decided not to do it. I mean, it's amazing. It was in 2009, I think. Kevin Rudd just unilaterally said, no, we're not going to implement the recommendations of the Brennan Committee. We're not going to have a Bill of Rights. Well, just as a sort of footnote to that, the, um, rather depressingly, the UK would actually like to withdraw from the mm. European Convention on mm. Human Rights and, and have its own kind of a, a arrangement, um, which is a depressing sign. But, uh. Although English legal decisions have gradually um, caught up with the thinking in yeah. the Human Rights Charter, that's very interesting to see the, the way it has developed. I should so, say the Conservative Party, not the whole... Yeah, 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 yeah. 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 Well, you can regard the whole of Australia as a great big conservative party, I think. Thank you. Thank you all. Um, interesting you raised the Bill of Rights. Um, I guess in 1891... Can you just put it a bit closer to... Sorry, yeah. 1891, on the back of a boat, three or four gentlemen um, took to the Hawkesbury to cobble together that thing that we call our constitution. Um, it was tinkered with a bit but through the 1890s, but essentially it came together and went to England and in 1901 we all celebrated. Because a Tasmanian got a cold, as I understand it, and didn't join the drafting party of the 1891 Constitutional Convention, the Bill of Rights was never seen again. At a time when we're talking about capital punishment, human rights, climate change, Australia really in a global context, We've got a foundation document that still talks about a Commonwealth responsibility for lighthouses and navigational buoys. <laughs> if we ask our politicians, they will never, ever, ever get it done and do anything with our constitution. Your thoughts on whether we can ever raise that in a popular sense if we continue the discussion for more than a six week period at a time. We need the lighthouses to see the boats. <laughs> we do, but we don't want to see the boats, do we? <laughs> That, that's actually, it reminds me of a great um, cartoon, I can't remember whose it was, but it was Julia Gillard at the top of a lighthouse and the switch was in a conspicuously off position and she's saying we had to because it was, uh, oh, and this is the light on the hill lighthouse, mm. and she said we had to turn it off, it was attracting the boats. Mm. <laughs> mm. Um, uh, I, it, we will not see a constitutional bill of rights in Australia in my lifetime, that's for sure whether 30 or 40 years after that, maybe. But I mean, our constitution is very old fashioned. It has, in effect, no guarantees of rights of any sort. Um, it, it deals with the machinery of government. Um, and the only thing that looks like a human right is the implied right of free political communication. But I say it's implied. The High Court found that it was there looking at the interstices the, in, the curious thing about that is that we have drafted the constitutions of countries like Papua New Guinea and Nauru, which used to be protectorates of ours, and we drafted for them constitutional bills of rights. But we can't, we can't embrace the idea of having even a statutory bill of rights uh, for us. So I think it's going to be a really, really long wait. Mm. Down the front here. At the back, and then a lady at the front. Thank you. 
Um, this question is about, or refers back to the, the world order, and I'm, I'm thinking about um, the rise of China and how it's, we're starting to see it remaking international institutions in its own mould. It's starting out with economic institutions like the um, Asian Investment Bank, but they're obviously not very happy with the post-World War II human rights um, institutions and, you know, they, they obviously have a very different view on human rights to the Western world and with their growing influence and the, the fact that we're looking at having a sort of bilateral balance of power in the world, how is that going to impact what we understand to be human rights in the world going forward? Oh, that's, that's a really good question. I mean, the, the, the whole question of China and what, what its impact is going to be is just... Uh, very complicated, and uh, you know, I'm, I'm no expert on China at all. I deal with the Middle East and Europe, but uh, I mean, my sense is that the pressure on human rights on the Chinese government is coming more from within than from without, and they've adopted this strategy of economic liberalization before political, or instead of <laughs> political liberalization, but the effect of economic liberalization is you've got a rising middle class who are increasingly educated, who are increasingly exposed, to the views of you know, the global community, for want of a better word. Uh, and uh, you know, as a result of them, some of them think, oh, this human rights is quite a good idea, right? And, um, and I think that the pressure is likely to increase. They can already see signs of pressure in China on human rights. And I think that the pressure is likely to come from within. And I find, get quite a lot of hope from that. I mean, obviously, one doesn't want to be too optimistic. Um, China has been, played a very negative role in, in human rights, particularly within its own borders. Um, but I, 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 I'm not entirely despondent. Uh, what you think, Julian? Uh, I defer to your greater knowledge. <laughs> yes. Well, the question is, how can I get connected with the UN to get, you know, at least some sort of, of connection going for doing these sorts of events? How do we lobby? How do you lobby? Um, well, you have to decide who your target really is. I mean, I don't know whether the UN is the right the right target for this. Um, uh, and you, you, maybe you need some fund, to do some fundraising uh, to... Um, uh, um, yeah. Yeah. It, de it depends on, it depends on, on, the, on the issue um, very much. Uh, you know, and you have to select your targets. But you know, lobbying is for us the, the, the most important kind of element of our work. The research and the exposure through the media, I mean, that's all kind of well and good, but we don't want our reports to sit on shelves and gather mm. dust. It's absolutely essential that, you know, they should have impact. Otherwise, what, what's the point of, of doing the, this work? And even There's a lot of competition, isn't there, for mm. the attention of very few ears, there I is. suppose. There is. Actually, I think you should get Human Rights Watch on board mm. because they're more, more effective and less mm. political. <laughs> Sorry, Tom. <laughs> <laughs> but we're not, unfortunately, we're not, uh, or, or fortunately, I don't know, we're not a peace organization. We don't take a position on armed conflict. I think that's an important thing to, to say. And, the, and there's a good reason for that, is that we, you know, when we, when we work on armed conflict, we, uh, we try to expose the abuses on both sides or on all sides in these multi-sided conflict. And if we took a position on whether the conflict itself was right or wrong, then we, we, wouldn't be, we couldn't be taken seriously by all sides and we'd be, be seen as partisan. Mm. Our time has gone so quickly. Uh, it's been fascinating. I, I know we've just only touched on, you know, things. There's so many other other things we could have talked about, but uh, it's been really terrific to, to hear the both of you together. Tom, thank you particularly for coming all the way from Baltimore to be at the Wheeler Centre. Thank you very uh, Tom much. Tom Porteous and Julian Burnside.